Welcome to No Way But North, where we talk about the miracles of recovery and the tools used to achieve them. My name is Cooper Lyons. My clean date is November 27th, 2010, and I am your host. As always, I'm joined by the big man himself, Big John Meldrum, Chocolate Bear. Chocolate Bear? Chocolate Bear. Where the hell did that come from? I was watching Scrubs the other night. The Black Paul Bunyan. I like that. No, God, that's, you were not that good call at me, throwing. Call, call me John Henry. <laughs> I see you over there giggling, Alex. Oh, oh yeah, buddy. How are you doing today, sir? I'm doing real good. It's a beautiful day out. It is. I'm inside. <laughs> <laughs> you know. I couldn't uh, tell if that was sarcastic or not. Saving lives and rebuilding relationships, uh, right? That's, all, that's what we're that's about. What we do. Yeah, it's <laughs> good. Guys, we're joined by Tom Haddon. Before I get into the, the part where I try to make our guests blush by talking about how awesome they are, we're going to get into the quote. Um, I'm still using my phone because we had some printer malfunctions. So here it is. Unlike guilt, which is the feeling of doing something wrong, shame is the feeling of being something wrong. Marilyn J. Sorensen. Mm. What comes to your mind you think about that, Tom? Um, shame. You know, that, <laughs> you know, you know we, we, uh, we just had multiple opportunities over my, my career to, to deal with uh, people with the throes of addiction. And uh, she, shame seems to be one of those key, mm-hmm. you know, components of continued addiction. And I think that uh, both, both recovery programs inside of... of uh, treatment and outside of treatment, you know, it should be one of the key aspects of, of um, stabilizing. Otherwise, the person's going to continue with addiction. Addiction requires shame. It yeah. requires dishonesty and shame. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you kind of, well, now I have to think of something else to say because you took the words right out of my mouth that last little bit. That was good. <laughs> what comes to your mind when you're thinking about that, John? I'll read it for you again because he doesn't listen to me talk. I'm trying so to pull I have to read my, it twice. my script. Unlike guilt, which is the feeling of doing something wrong, shame is the feeling of being something wrong. Marilyn J. Sorensen. Uh, it, it's shame and guilt is such a it's such a hairy thing mm-hmm. that we like. It's a very gentle approach because you know, especially being at North Point and then being at Ashwood, we'd always hear everybody come in and like, oh, I'm just so full of shame and guilt. Like I've just got so much shame and guilt. And they blend them together. Yeah. And so it's, it's hard because when you finally educate a person on the difference, the true difference of what shame and guilt is, like they see it and they're like, oh, like I get it now. Yeah. I'm not just blending them together and making it. So like, I feel like the biggest thing is like, when I hear that quote, like you have to educate the per- person uh, the the true difference between shame and guilt and just not blend it together because one one can be beneficial because one helps us learn yeah well and that's kind of what i'm thinking like if i consistently in doing things that are worthy of guilt it's kind of hard to convince myself that i shouldn't be ashamed of myself so i kind of need like like time to be able to do good things Mm mm-hmm Right, prove to myself that I'm not a person worthy of shame. Prove that like I can go to treatment and stay at full 28 days and do the assignment and um, you know help another person be a good patient or get out and get a job and go to work. Things like that. Um, I think it's really important. And well, I'm sure we'll get into this, but giving that person examples of like you're not a bad person. You've done bad things, but you're also capable of doing good things. Right. Right. So, well. Without further ado, I'm going to try to embarrass Tom. I don't know if that's possible, but (laughs) Tom Hammond is a utilization review specialist at North Point Recovery. Tom has more than 10 years in the treatment industry and over 15 years in recovery. Tom has experience in addiction treatment programs and in running addiction treatment programs in corrections in outpatient and inpatient settings. Tom's also a Washington native and a Boise transplant. By the way, how are you liking Boise? Love Boise. Compared to compared to Washington? Yeah. You got to be happy over the traffic. Yeah, well, because you lived in like true Seattle, traffic's right? Traffic's just getting intrusive, man. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's getting intrusive in Boise. I think it's the biggest. Give it another five in years. Boise. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, nine families a day, a day moving into this area. I've never from heard other that areas. That's and actually, I'm a I'm an Oregon native. Oh, okay. Yeah, just My to apologies. get that right. That's that's all right. Don't that's disrespect. Sloppy put some research. put some respect on his Go name. Go Beavs. Respect. And, uh, you know, it's the Beavs thing. And oh, then, okay. Um, as long as it's not the Ducks. Yeah, so Washington State, you know, uh, 
I really like Idaho. I really Good. do. Yeah. We well, we like you. Yeah, I was Thanks, gonna say John. we're glad and we're lucky <laughs> to have you. I love North Point. I'm totally sold on the philosophy. Uh, yep. You know, and again, saving lives, restoring relationships, yep. our core values. Um, seemed like a lot smaller company when I started working here. Really? You're right. You know? Seriously. And it's just, Goodness. it's so ballooned, but you know, good things become bigger things. Yep. Ballooned in a good way. Oh, Not yeah. like yeah. just oh, yeah. ridiculous. Like it still oh, no. has the family vibe to it, but like right. I was sitting there feeling it because it's been like, I've been here for three years now. And I like, I remember starting, it was just like Ashwood. Rinky dink. And North Point. Like that was it. Right. And now, like, now to think about it, like, you know, Point, I'm getting like North Point, Washington emails and I'm yeah. getting, you know, we got, you know, Edmonds and Evergreen and North, or North, or North Ashwood, <laughs> Northwood, Ashwood, Boise, Nampa, North Point, you know, right. other plans to open up other things. Yeah. And it's just like, yeah. well, North speaking Gate. of which, if somebody from Seattle is watching right now and has a loved one or themselves are looking for treatment, we have officially opened in Washington, North Point, Washington. It's a 44 bed medical detox inpatient 28 day program. Um, Google it, check it out. It's pretty easy to find. Yeah. So, you should put it, you should put it in the, uh, that's, that's an Alex thing. Oh, Alex, <laughs> make it happen, baby. Right. But yeah, it's, it's, it's really cool to see the growth of our company yeah. Yeah. in the way that it has. And just like, just just growth of on a personal level too like i looking at documentation i did 5 months ago compared to like where i'm at now yeah. and like you know the staff that i have that have it's just really cool to see it's well really and cool. our like the foundation of where it started is the state almost exactly the same it's right. more defined and clear right. but it's the same thing that mm -hmm. it you is. know it's Bobby what started. works well exactly right basic and, yeah abstinence based treatment uh huh abstinence based treatment with a culture of love behind it yep. yeah yeah, and the culture has not changed even with growth. It's just grow. Really it's grown. Yeah. Right? It's grown. Like you know, every, walk every into person in a grocery store and see somebody in a North Point sweatshirt. It's yeah. Like, uh, I saw I had this morning. Yeah. yeah. I, drive, I stopped out the grocery store to get a card from my ex wife for Mother's Day and for the kids. Yeah. For the kids. Yeah. And I saw some dude I'd never seen before. I didn't recognize him, but he was rocking a North, Point, North nice. Point hoodie. I was like, there it's one go. of my alumni, man. Yeah, my I mean, secret agents out in the world. I mean, really, but it's just <laughs> it's cool to see that, and especially with like the new people that we brought in, like John Flanagan, and yeah, like all these, like they cool have the guy. same exact philosophy, right? That, like we've been care. It's not something like we have to teach these people. They just come in and they're just like they're there. It's yeah, like right. it's really cool. So, yeah. well, enough bragging about how awesome we are. We are going to start talking about treating shame. Um, so we did do this episode a while ago, um, but it was on audio, and we wanted everybody to see how gorgeous Tom was. So we're bringing. I wish back. everybody could smell how gorgeous Tom, Tom was. Tom does smell really good. It's kind of a <laughs> he known does. Thing. It's like sandalwood and man. <laughs> and go. man, are those the same thing? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we're going to be talking about treating shame. Like Tom said, you can't have addiction without shame. It just doesn't. Addiction doesn't survive without it, basically. Right. Um, so we're going to talk about the, the role shame plays in addiction and um, kind of how to treat it, right, in, in a group therapy setting or in one-on-one -on -one therapy setting. So right. um, first thing I got in my notes, kind of talk about the sources of shame. So um, using behavior, um, you know, family environment, uh, the stigma around addiction, things right. like that. Uh, right. So just talk to us a little bit about like where shame stems from for the average shameful person. Man, the etiology of shame is so large. It, it, first of all, shame, you know, and we talked about the differences between shame and guilt, right? Yep. Guilt mm. means I did something wrong. And shame, shame comes from this internal drive that if I told you about myself and what my behaviors look like or I my thinking am. or my emotions, I am wrong. Or you would think there's something wrong with me, yeah. that I'm different, that I need to be you know, disposed of. Um, it's that I'm bad. You know, guilt means you know, I, I cut somebody off in traffic, I, I need to slow down. You know? yeah. um, shame means if that person knew who I was, they wouldn't like me. Mm -hmm. you know? And since we're very social creatures and addiction, there's so much that goes with addiction. Not just, not just the using behaviors, not just the illegality of the behaviors that go along with it, but the things that people do to stay in addiction. Yeah. I haven't met one person in addiction who loves their addiction. 
Sure, they enjoy the high yeah. or they enjoy the feelings that come along with it, but they do not enjoy the addictive part, the getting, the seeking, the finding, the doing. Um, and those are, the, those are the areas of shame. Um, there's a lot that goes along with it. And then all the comorbid stuff too. Um, everything from, you know, uh, childhood sexual abuse mm -hmm. and, yeah. and uh, childhood abuse. Yeah. Neglect, abuse, abandonment, um, resentment, uh, all of that, you know, and it, and it goes deep. And there's one thing that drugs and alcohol do really well. And it's to, to blind the person from all of that. They don't have to feel it. They don't have to deal with the emotions yeah. for a period of time. But then when addiction kicks in, addiction kicks in it means i have to do this so that i don't have to feel that anymore mm -hmm. so our job you know is to help people stop using drugs well yeah that's pretty easy just stop using but the next thing that's going to happen is all of these behaviors follow you know this is why you can't just medicate addiction you can't just yeah. medicate these these other issues because they still remain deep inside the person well, not just behaviors, but feelings and like internal voices, right? Like right. our internal motivators and the right. way we talk to ourselves and the right. way we view the world and other yeah. people in our lives. There's nothing wrong with that internal voice. It's, it's usually speaks your, your primary language mm -hmm. yeah. and, uh, you know, it's, it's your own voice. And, um, I've had the opportunity. One of the most poignant things I, I, I'd met this young girl is working for another clinic. Um, and we'd done this assessment and she'd become medically addicted to medications. And, uh, she talked about, you know, how things had changed. She started listening to her internal voice. She'd lost some legs uh, in a train accident Oh wow! and, um, very young person. And she said that, you know, she started to listen to that internal voice, you know, not a lot that got her to the addictive point. So there wasn't a lot of work to be done, but that internal voice that she said she listens to was the same internal voice that told her not to jump on the train that night. Hmm. You know, so that she listens to it now. Um, and some of people would call that a higher power. Some would, you right. know, spiritual awakening yeah. of some type. Yeah, some yeah. kind. <laughs> yeah, and getting to that, you know, within that cultural, with, with 12 steps or in, in a treatment agency, in groups or in one-on-ones in -on with counselors. With counselors, be if they're in recovery or if they're not in recovery, I've seen great and bad and both. But with within that, it's that spirit of acceptance mm -hmm. and listening and non-judgment. Um, you know, knowing their, the counselor's own issues um, with counter-transference before they, they walk into something like that and being able to really help someone process through mm -hmm. it, validating the person and allowing them to be heard. Um, and that environment takes time. Yeah. It takes so much more time than just two weeks and three weeks and 28 days and a year. It takes time to really seat recovery to the point where the person's getting into talking about things that they feel that other people would not approve of them for. But the culture of, let's say, 12 steps, you know, that's what they do. You know, you walk into a 12 step meeting and you hear some guy laughing about his last DUI, you know, and, yep. and what it, all the pain that it caused him 10 years ago. And a newcomer hears that someone new into recovery and they're like, hey, that's I've been feeling that same thing. So it's well, they it's, hear it over and over right, and over and over right. and over. You know, and over there's again. this levity around, hey, this is who we are. We're not we're not built on something that that's good about us. We're actually built on some of our shortcomings. Yeah. And um well, so that's kind of a good, that. sorry, go ahead. Oh, no. Well, so it's kind of a good transition. So talking into like the isolation that shame causes, right? Because right? that's kind of the, what I'm hearing, correct me if I'm right. wrong, is shame is kind of the, um, isolation is the, the biggest symptom of shame. Well, it's embarrassment, right? So, yeah. You have, and you pull yourself away from other people. One of my favorite quotes about addiction is that the opposite of addiction is not recovery, it's community. Right. Right? right, and she can't like if you're full of shame and and kind of like that lying and hiding from people, you can't. Well, have you just that. you you take you take take an alcoholic, right? You know, somebody that starts drinking alcohol, at, you know, fifteen or sixteen, seventeen years old. This is social environment, Third right? Third grade, it's super fun. Yeah. It's great. Right. Nine, and you know, then you have somebody that same person. You know, after the weekend's over, Monday comes around, and they still want to drink, and everybody else is going back to work or going to school. And so, like, they, every addict knows the difference between right and wrong, 
Like, you know what's good, you know what's bad, you know what you should. Like, is drinking and driving right? Should I be, you know, spending hundreds or thousands of dollars on heroin and meth? No, like, these are bad things. But the shame that is, is from a social standpoint, what ends up happening is they know what they're doing isn't correct. So they pull away from society, right? And they sit there because they're embarrassed because they know that this isn't the correct way they should be living. Yeah. Right. They shouldn't, you know, they don't need to be drinking, you know, at nine o'clock in the morning to make it through the day and taking shots in the bathroom or, you know, getting off of work and buying, a, you know, a half a gallon of vodka and then finishing that off by the next one. Like they don't need to be doing that. They shouldn't be doing that. It's not healthy, but they're they embarrassed. They're ashamed of themselves. it. Yeah. Well, and I don't think there's anything like you you don't hear about cravings, right? I did not hear anything about cravings or like not being able to stop yourself from yeah. doing something right. until I got into recovery. Mm-hmm. Right. Like that's not a thing in normal society. So when you're that person, like I can't, I mean, we have all talked about it before. It's mm-hmm. like, I told myself I wasn't going to do it. I told myself I wasn't going to do it. And like within five minutes I was doing the exact thing right. I said I wasn't going right. to. Right. Well, by society standards, it's... You're weak-minded. Well, it's not cravings. It's just like... There you go. Giving, giving in to... What makes you feel good, yeah. right? Craving, cravings, triggers, and stuff like that. Like these aren't these aren't terms that you hear right. within basic conversation. Yeah. You know, that's what you hear in the recovery environment. That's what you hear in in outpatient, inpatient, uh, detox, community support, sponsorship, like alumni programs. Those are the type of things that you hear about, but. You take somebody that doesn't know anything about it, right? They're going to shame. Like, I see it all the time. I saw something on Facebook the Even other day. intentionally, right? Yeah, I saw somebody on Facebook. He was this guy sitting in a car, and he's just like, oh, you're, you're an addict? You're a heroin addict? Oh. That's a bunch of bullshit. Like, you're just a weak person. Da, da, da. He's, like, talking about the disease model of addiction. Like, like, those type of people make it hard for people. Like, you feel guilty, right? I made a mistake. I can fix that. We all make mistakes. I tell the clients all the time, we are de- not we are not defined by the mistakes that we make. Because if every single person in the world was defined by the mistakes they made, every single person in this world would be a shitty person. But you have people that shame the hell out of people that use substances or have used them to cope or have had traumatic experiences and these people just sit there and they and they absorb that and they truly believe that I'm a fucked up person like I'm a terrible person because I use drugs yeah. it's a shitty thing I, cut yeah <laughs> no that <laughs> right. was great sorry, like, I, yeah. sorry this is the inpatient in me this, yeah. Is, this, yeah. this is program manager that's the out. exposure to it you yeah. know that, that front line exposure to it yeah. you know because you see the, the, the good you know in someone who thinks they're just a dirt bag because society again yeah. you know has put this label on I mean if you take an average seven-year-old and ask him, you know, someone who's entered psychologically into the realm of reality. They yeah. know that Santa Claus is not really out there. It's like mom and dad. So if you're, <laughs> if you don't believe that what? yet, and Jonathan, I'm sorry. I Alex, that close your ears. Right. So, <laughs> you know, they've entered into this. reality. They know when people die, you know, that they're gone forever. Um, that the Easter bunnies, you know, actually mom and dad or uncle joe or or mom and mom or dad and dad and they're they're hiding these eggs right and um they've entered into reality you ask them what an addict is and the first thing that's going to pop into their mind you ask an adult that you know for me it was my first experiences with it and it was this drummer from prineville oregon who was in high school and he'd gotten a hold of the wrong drugs and he had significant mental health problems Mm -hmm. i can remember coming out of the cinnabar restaurant with my mom holding my hand and this guy going how did you get out of there you know so that was my idea of what addiction was right and that was my social you know label if that's what an addict is so when i got into addiction when i was in my addiction i wasn't as bad as him you know i I had a house i'm not as bad as you are you know and that and that denial process of that led to more and more degradation of my character and more and more secrets and more and more of that holding back and it wasn't until I could actually connect with other people. And that takes, again, it takes time. Mm -hmm. You have to build trust, not just 
it's not an overnight deal to start dealing with social labeling because we buried it so deep and it's such an ingrained belief mm -hmm. that I can't be an addict, you know? And, and then our family, our family systems around that. Um, just recently, man, I, I got the, just the greatest opportunity to work with this, these two people, you know? And they were, they were talking about their rights in recovery and not really looking at the 12 steps too hard because the significant other was not too interested in Al-Anon, which I think is a very healthy society for people who are afflicted by addiction. But there's this social idea that if you go to Al-Anon, you get to go complain about your qualifier. And no, you get to go to Al-Anon and work on yourself. Yeah. You know, you work on the shame that you've dealt on. with, you know, over your lifetime. And, well, it depends and, on what you go there for. Well, healthy people would not stay with an addict. Yeah. You know, I, I, there's a reason why you've stayed there. And those are the reasons you most likely need to work on. Mm -hmm. In this case, it was more about communicating. And it didn't have to say, well, this is about shame. It was about that craving thing. And craving defines addiction. Craving defines mm -hmm. addiction. It's a part of your brain you don't get to control. It's just as common as breathing. Some people crave nicotine. Some people crave coffee. Some people crave food when they're hungry enough. When <laughs> someone uses enough substance to change that part of their brain, <sighs> craving's there. Yeah. And then to tell somebody that that's wrong, well, no, you, you biologically changed your chemical makeup. Yeah. And to have a craving is somewhat normal. So to have a family member say, oh, when they have a craving, I think they're going to use, they're going to, it's just the worst thing ever. It shuts that person down from actually sharing, hey, I'm having a craving. Oh, well, it makes them feel ashamed. It, right, right. You know, I'm bad if I tell you this. So having that fam those two family members say, hey, you know, when I have a craving, I'm going to tell you about it, but I don't want you to react to it. I don't need yeah. help. And this is why, you know, well, really setting that boundary. Well, we see that so much within our family, our family groups, like right. especially Ashwood. You know, when I was right. doing the family healing group, you'd have, I remember one day I'm talking about like, I would mentioned, I'd said something like pause. And they're like, what's that? And I was like, post-acute withdrawals. And they're like, right. what's that? Oh, I was man. like, next class, we're going to educate right. on what post-acute withdrawals are. Right. So I go in there. And I educate them on what post-acute withdrawals are, for what substances, what they can look like, how long. You know, and the family members are asking all these great questions. Right. And then, so this is on Tuesday, Thursday rolls around, and all the patients that had family members in, they're like, fuck, John, like, I don't know what you did Tuesday, dude, but, like, they came in, and they're like... I know that you're not using now because, like, you got low motivation. Right. This is post-acute withdrawals. Right. And, like, but... In a good way or a bad way? In a good way. Okay. In right. a good way because before... Yeah, it's coming what, out into the light. Because now but, what, you know. because what, they, what family members were seeing right. is they were seeing somebody struggle with post-acute withdrawals, which are very similar to withdrawals from substances. Right. And saying, you've relapsed. Right. I don't believe you. You're full right. of shit. Like you went to a meeting, but like, why are like, why are you sleeping twelve hours? Why why are you so blah? Why are you having these manic spikes of, right. you know, a meth addict coming off a of meth? Like you're super excited one minute, right. and then you're, you know, down the nest. down in the dumps. Like, right. and I was explaining it. They're like, oh, like that makes so much sense. Yeah, because like that's what people do. They don't know, and so they shame. Like they, well, well they don't scared. even do it on purpose. Like they they no. confront people, right? Again. And an addict or somebody in recovery will take that personally. It's just like, well, fuck, I'm trying, I'm doing everything I can, I can that I'm that I'm able to do right now. But people think, still think that I'm that I'm fucking up, that I'm messing up, that I'm using or I'm lying and I'm manipulating. Which they might. I'm not saying right. that people <laughs> won't do that. But when family members are family members or just people in general are educated on what addiction and substance abuse looks like, right. they're less likely to point the finger and come down heavy on people around them because that's what it is. It's pure ignorance because they right. just don't know. Yeah. Right. But it has such a powerful effect on people and society for, wanting, for, for people in society wanting to get healthy and get clean and get sober. 
because they're like, people aren't going to believe me. People aren't going to give me the shake. You talk about inmates out of the prison, right? They get out. Right. And people still, you know, they could be out 10, 15 years. And as soon as people find out, you know, I was incarcerated for substance abuse or burglary or, right. you know, aggravated battery or something like that when I was 20 years old and now I'm 35, they still, like, they're still ashamed right. and they still, and people engage in those behaviors because that's just what people expect them to do. So they just get a case of the fuckets and they're like, well, you, you want me to, prophecy. you want me to act yeah. this there way, I yeah. will give it to you. Right. Yeah. yeah if this is what if this is what you expect from me, then I'm going to continue it. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, great. You know, especially starting with family, you know, with a, with a person who's entering into recovery and their, their immediate support systems, um, not just family, but immediate support systems, employers, um, because, you know, again, I, you know, flashing back, you know, to Kennewick and I'm thinking of this, this person, you know, who came in smelling like alcohol, dropping their son off at my, my desk and saying, fix him, you know, basically change his oil, you know, really objectifying this person. But on the other side of it, you know, when he was, when this, when this client was not acting right, was not, was all disheveled and, and out of his head and, and um, sleeping all the time and having those mood swings of post-acute withdrawal, even talking about using dreams to his family. He was almost shunned until the point we got the opportunity to actually talk to him about mm -hmm. it. That, that you know, if, if you want this person to feel normal again, just go buy him some heroin because that's their new norm. Yeah. This is what early recovery looks like. It's yeah. ugly. And it, it's and not, not pretty. It can and, be really uncomfortable. And it can be beautiful. Right. You know, because you get to sit through that discomfort and you build these great tools to learn to talk openly about it in society. But then again, we've got these great 12 step organizations and other organizations that are based on recovery that educate family and give them the tools and the culture to actually change those old belief systems around addiction. Mm -hmm. That addiction is a maladaptive pattern of use. We can all see that. It leads to dysfunction in someone's life, you know? Nobody likes dysfunction. No, oh, no. But the other side of that definition is a tendency to relapse. There's a tendency to return to use over any period of time of abstaining. Yeah. That's what we want to get rid of. You know, the addiction's gonna stay, the thinking, the behaviors. That's there for a long time. Cravings, hey man, you show me a new flavor of Crown Royal and I you know, tend to look at my wife and say, hey, maybe we should buy that. You know? <laughs> and that's a craving. But getting rid of that shame and being open about it, and that's what we I do, we laugh, laugh about, about it, it yeah. right? Because again, our culture has taught us, you know, our recovery culture has taught us that secrets kill us. Yeah. That the most dangerous thing that I have is my brain and it tells me to use. Yep. You know, and, yeah. and within that, having safe people, a sponsor, a culture, a counselor um, to go to and say, hey, this is what I'm thinking. And then bounce that off other people in you know, giving them the tools to say, hey, when I'm having a craving and then it goes both ways, you know, with family members and close supporters. Hey, when I see this behavior, it worries me. How would you like me to react to that instead of, you know, I'm used to reacting in this way. You know, you're doing this and being very accusatory yeah. instead of being helpful and, and caring. And again, that that real caring component that goes along with recovery, because that's really I mean, I've never been to an A meeting and found somebody. Well, I digress. I've been to a I, I've never, <laughs> I rarely I've rarely been at a 12 step meeting in my recovery where someone is there for an opposite motive other than to help other people. That's the reason for meetings. Yes. There's two parts to any 12 step. There's the meeting and that's where you can be approached by people in whom the problem has been solved, True. right? Yeah. So you learn a new cultural aspect and you, you, you gain acceptance. And then there's the program and it deals with shame. I mean, it, the, whole, the whole thing is about continually being honest with oneself and externalizing things in the past that used to cause someone to feel less than, mm -hmm. you know? If I'm drinking and I'm sitting in a bar until two o'clock in the morning and I got two kids at home and a wife that's worried about me, if everyone in that bar knew that about me, oh, they'd think less of me. Yeah. That's shame. Yeah. If, I, if I'm early in recovery and I'm, I'm talking to somebody else about, you know, 
I was in a bar until two o'clock in the morning for the last eight years straight. If they knew that about me, they'd think differently of me. So from the counseling side, it's about acceptance and love. Yeah, that's pretty common. Yeah. You know, just give but it also having love. Those, being able to confront with love. Oh, yeah. Right? Which, oh, yeah. to me, that's the marker of a good counselor. Line. Being able to have those Very boundaries fine and line. confront Confrontation. with love. Yeah. yeah that's because yeah. I'm shit. No. It's always, you know, <laughs> well, it, confrontations like that are so simple, too. It's usually, is that working for you? You know, yeah. is that is that the way you want to continue life or is there this other way where you can tell your wife, you know, this is how I feel about this and I don't want to live like that right. anymore? Because yeah. that sounds like an amends to me, you know, because it sounds a lot like that step nine when we go into there and we're, we're, we're not saying we're sorry for this stuff. We're saying this happened and this is how I'd like to handle it in the future. Yeah. You know? Mm -hmm. It's not well, an apology. In most you know, cases. it's funny because, like, I, <clears throat> you know, now with my position at, at North Point, you know, I, I do heavy assessments. And so it's, and I don't know if it's just been a theme for the last, you know, a couple weeks, but people come in, right? And we're going through the biopsych assessment. Yeah. Right? We're asking all these, so you know, these, these in depth questions, mm -hmm. right? right? Not to judge them, right? But, you know, You'll start and you'll ask questions like, you know, have you been, have you been abused? Have you, have you done this? Have you done that? And they're always like, no, 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 no. And then you're like, you creep towards the end of the assessment and like all these things start spilling out yeah, right. by accident, but they're so embarrassed and they are so ashamed. Yeah. Right. And like, so, you know, whenever I do assessments, I always have to preference, listen, I'm not here to judge you. Like, let it out. Like. If anything, this is the first time in your life that you can truly 100% say all the nasty and evil shit you've done with zero judgment. And they're like, ah, I don't know. And I've see, heard that shit it. before. That's I've it. heard it before. Yeah. And it's so hard to break down those walls because society, family, work, relationship, whatever, every environment that somebody that's struggled with addiction or just you know anything in general, when you start putting guilt and shame, they, there has been a situation where things have been used against them and their drinking or their use has been used against them and made right. them feel like a terrible person or they've seen other people do it. Yeah. Right? So like if me and you are doing the same thing and Tom comes over and he's like, Cooper, 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 and I'm like, fuck, I'm not going to say anything because then Tom will think I'm a fucked up person yeah. too. But like I'm doing way more worse shit than Cooper is, <laughs> like, you know. So it's hard because we don't want to we don't want to be looked on. So like yeah. we don't say it because we know how people respond. Yeah. If I'm shooting heroin up in between my toes, and but this person's shooting heroin in his arm, yeah, right. We're yeah. doing the same thing, right. right? But like you can just tell he's yeah. messed up, and I'm just a little off, right? But I'm doing the same dirt. But I see how people respond to him. I don't want them to respond to me like that. Right. That whole denial system. Yeah. yeah I, you know, went through uh, my last treatment experience, this inpatient system. You know, I met this great guy. Had so many different people from so many different cultures, so many different age groups. Hmm. You know, I can see all their faces today. I can still see this one guy, you know. And, uh, he, you know, he says, I was never an addict because I never shot up before five o'clock at night. Yeah. You know, and that was his belief system. But, but, and would, it was his he belief, would, yeah. He would withdraw all day long until he got off work, shoot up, go, you know, go through the process, wake up in the morning, be in withdrawal from, you know, from heroin. Fuck. And say, you know, people who use heroin, who are addicts, who are junkies, you know, that social label, they... They use, you know, I, and again, you know, I, I hear addict or tweaker or drunk or alcoholic and my old system goes straight into some guy stealing booze at the back of the, you know, the refrigerator yep. at some convenience store. But my, my new system says, no, that's a human being, you know, that's dealt through a lot in their life. And not only that, they've survived because addicts are survivors. They yeah. really are. Yeah. We get into these systems like you were talking about assessments. I love, you know, I used to love to do assessments, and I the way I'd set up a good assessment and if what I do is I'd say, you know, have you ever been to treatment before? And and some people, you know, they've had multiple treatment mm -hmm. experiences, and those people who said, yeah, I'd say, you know, assessments are kind of backwards. I'd love to just continually assess you throughout your program, but the way it works is that I've got to get all this information up front. And you've been in treatment before, so you know boundaries, right? So I'm gonna cross every boundary you have 
right now. And you just met me five minutes ago. Mm -hmm. I'm going to ask you questions about your sexuality and about your mental states and whether or not you've been abused, some really deep stuff, you know? And to know that I'm not going to judge you by it, yep. you know? Which is a lot to ask of anybody. Right. Let alone people that have been through a significant amount of shit. And for years have been drowning that with substance and hiding it, you know, being not telling a soul. Yeah, just that whole omission thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And building that shame, building that shame, building that shame. More and more lies, more and more omissions. Yeah. Until finally we have this expectation in early recovery that you come out and say everything in the first five minutes. Yeah. You know? And whether or not that happens sometimes bases on whether someone's funded for treatment. Yeah. There's some real inequities to that. Yeah. Real inequities. So, so we basically we just crossed in kind of the last part of, our, of, our, of the episode is treating shame, right? So it sounds like for the individual it's hopefully building a foundation of trust, mm. right? That community yeah. and shining a light on secrets. Right. right. And then obviously all in, in all three of those having love and support um, within all, all of those. Right. So yeah. what as a society or even as just as a treatment industry or as, as an organization, um, how do we treat the stigma surrounding drug addiction, alcoholism, which I know that's a giant question. Right. Right. You know, some of my fondest memories, again, I was headed this 12 step meeting and this lady that I'd known at 32 years old, I'd known this lady, she'd sold me lunch tickets, right? Mm. In grade school. Mm. And, uh, you know, I, I, I know she's probably not around anymore, but, uh, I was walking down to this 12 step meeting and her husband was the deacon of this church. Cause that's where they had him where in my little hometown. And, uh, she's, I, I'm walking through the parking lot and she says, where are you going? What are you doing at the church? And I said, oh, I'm, I'm going downstairs to, you know, this, this meeting. And she goes, oh, I thought that only people who drank went to that meeting. And I thought you stopped drinking a few years ago. And, and actually it had only been like eight months. Right. <laughs> so, um, within that, that, within that statement, it was such an opportunity to say, no, these are people who are really getting together and helping other people who come through the door. Yeah. You know, and that, no, it, it's not about stopping drinking or stopping using drugs because that's when the problem really starts for the addict. But there's been all this chaos in the family and in their community during the, the time that they've been actively using that the drug is the primary person. It's, there is no individual. Everything revolves around the drug and getting the drug and using the drug and some of the behaviors that go into that, especially in the heroin culture. You know, mm -hmm. if you can't fit into your <clears throat> culture that you've grown up with and, and no matter what your geoeconomic or color, or whatever that is, the things that people do to stay addicted because they have to, they have to, they're driven by a primal urge mm -hmm. to use is sometimes so difficult to talk about with another human being because of that label and that judgment. It's, so getting to that point again, you know, today things have changed. Um, I'm, I'm really um, excited about the anonymous people movement. Yep. Um, you know, I, I'm a firm believer that, you know, I can go anywhere and talk about my 12 step experience. I'm not afraid of it. Anyone can judge me. Um, I do have a qualifier that goes along with that, which is I have a daily reprieve on alcohol, which is, which is based on my spiritual experience. So if these people ever were to see me drunk, it's not my program that failed me. It's me failing yeah. my program, you know, and that's screaming from the rooftops that this stuff works on the other side of that, you know, we hide behind that autonomy thing. So when I'm in public and I, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm blessed to be married and, and, uh, wife's a professional and we do these these meetings you know when i was working at the prison it was always fun you know we go to, to go to these these um social events with with some pretty influential financial people and they'd say where what do you do for a living and i'd say well i just got out of prison 
<laughs> at five o'clock tonight. You I'm know? sure your wife loved Oh, that. yeah, she, she thought that was great. <laughs> but, you know, on the other side of that, when I tell someone, you know, I'm in addictions and, and I, I help people with addictions, I'm a counselor, you know, whatever, I, whatever my, my job was at that point, the, the next question out of their, their mind, or out of their mouth is either are you an addict or I have a family member yep. that has a problem. You know, so being able to be there in that situation and say, you know what, mm -hmm. it's okay, it's all right, you know, that everyone in the world has been touched by addiction and, and know, you know, to those, I go to, I go to a 12 step group and I say, you know, my name's, uh, my name's Tom and I'm an alcoholic. I'm an alcoholic and my name's Tom. Usually alcohol comes first, you know, even though there was a lot of other substance mixed <laughs> in there. But within that, um, out in the real world so that we're dropping that stigmatism, that, that stigma of, of what an alcoholic is. I just tell people that I'm in long-term recovery and what that means, you know, because they, they do not understand no. alcoholic. Yeah. They do understand recovery. Yeah. You know, that this well, is there's what different it took. feelings attached to right. both of those words. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. So it sounds like education. Right. Whether on a grand scale community. or even just a one-on-one -on -one oh, conversation. Yeah. You know what you're doing. You That's know? exactly what we're doing. We're normalizing recovery. Yep. We're taking it to the airwaves. Absolutely. Exciting you stuff. <laughs> but that, again, that's the culture of North Point. Exactly. You know, I look at it less as a fa uh, company and more of a family. Yep. So. Yep. All right, sir. Anything else you want to say to somebody out there that might be struggling from addiction, whose family members might be struggling from addiction, or even just somebody that's watching to educate themselves? Love them into recovery. Perfect. John? No, Tom, Tom did it. Tom, I appreciate you and your lovely wife coming and kicking it with us for a little it's bit It's always today. good to be with you guys. Always. Always, always a pleasure, brother. Yep. Right. Thanks right for joining on. us. All Thanks, right. man. All right, guys, that's No Way But North, where we talk about the miracles of recovery and the tools used to achieve them. Make sure to leave that like, um, that subscribe, and share with one person that you think could be getting value out of this podcast, whether it's um, for treatment themselves or even just to educate themselves. Thanks. Thank you. Peace. If you or a loved one are struggling with addiction, call 1-877-648-3125. The views and opinions expressed in no way but North do not reflect those of North Point Recovery or any other institution or organization.